thank you so much for joining us, Fernanda Olivares. Uh, Fernanda um, is joining us from Chile, Santiago, um, but is uh, originally from uh, Tierra del Fuego, um, a part of within the Chilean borders where the Sognam people live. Um, and they are the people of the peat. Uh, they have a really rich history of living with the peatlands. Um, and Fernanda will share a story about how historically her people um, have lived uh, with and through and all of the other um, words you can find for this, uh, the peatland um, and how this relationship is shaped uh, these days. And Fernanda has also been one of the creative collaborators for Turbatol Hol Hol Tol, um, the Chilean pavilion, um, which is part of the Biennale in Venice. And it's still on right now, I believe. So if anyone is in the area, we highly recommend you uh, visiting it. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, so without any further ado, um, please, Fernanda, take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored to be here. Um, well, I think the first thing to do always is to introduce myself. Um, Fernanda, I'm a Segnam woman. That's, that Segnam uh, is an indigenous tribe from the south of Chile and Argentina also, because yeah, a century ago, these two countries divided the island. And I think I've been thinking about what, how to orientate this conversation. And I really like to go with what is peatland? For us, for me, peatland is not just an, a beautiful and rich ecosystem. Uh, peatlands for me are ancestors. And for you to understand why is that? I think I had to go back to the, the very beginning of the time of the earth. The island, Tierra del Fuego, it was created by Timaukel, the one who is above the clouds that lives in the, in the sky. And this story is trespassed generation after generation. And it's also in some books. Um, it's not always accurate, the books, with our story, with our community. But um, back in the days when our ancestors, they lived freely in Tierra del Fuego, they, they didn't die. You know, they, they just uh, walk around the island. And when they felt tired, they lied or they just go to sleep anywhere in the road and some of these ancestors they woke up and continued walking and living but other ancestors they just they just stayed there and this is how the oh no, the mountains were created on the island the hills rivers uh, the trees the woods and animals the guanaco which is a kind of llama um the fox uh, different kind of birds and sea animals. And also, of course, uh, peatlands. Um, then we have this development of the, of the humanity in the island. And um, you know, so after, after some crucial period that I don't think is really good to, to talk about it right now because it would be really, really long. But the Segnam people start like living in peace, like always they just develop a kind of life. They, they were transhuman. Um, that means that they, they didn't make a house and, and live there. So they were just from one point to another inside the Haruwen, which is a, a family place into the island. And in this, in these places, they stayed only the, the right amount of time. Uh, it, it means that they never ate everything. When they start like looking at the, the, the trees, for example, or the bush, and there, was, there were no berries 
for example, they they start like planning the next point of, of for moving, and because it wasn't the idea to kill the island, because they start moving all over the year and next season they have to go back to that part and there has to be berries. So, well, basically this was a life for uh, millennia. A really peaceful, uh, this development of the island was really nice. <laughs> I, I mean, I, can, I, I feel like this was paradise. Uh, they just lived they didn't bother anybody and cohabitate with with everything with the animals and with the goods and everything was made out of an ancestor so this is the first point that i i'd love to to enlighten you know it's like or highlight um <laughs> everything the island is made or is an ancestor. Every every tree, every river, every animal is an ancestor. So when people come to us, to the, our community in Chile, and they say, but why do you think that, I don't know, it, it's bad to kill a tree? It's not like, oh no, it's not the tree provide us without oxygen and clear the, the, the air, it's not, just that it's like I'm not going to cut uh, a great 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 grandparent. So this is the the first connection that me myself, uh, like a certain woman, I have with the island and with the environment. And so to to make a little context to to the people I know, almost nobody is really aware of what is the Sagnan people, what they live, and what happened to us. Um, around uh, 130 years ago, um, we had uh, this colonization in the island. Uh, it was really, really late considering the time. Um, almost every colonization in Chile were, was, I don't know, 400 years ago, but ours was 130 years ago. So the, the idea of the colonizers was to clean the island, clean the lands for the ships. So that's when the, this genocide and exile started. So um, basically in 20 to 30 years, uh, they, they accomplished this in, I don't know, they didn't accomplish it well, but they thought they killed everyone of the Sagan people um, because there was no one in the site. No one would say that it's a Sagan. So um, this is how my story began. Uh, I, was, I wasn't born in Tierra del Fuego or even the, the region in the south. I was born in, in the central Chile, in the Valparaiso region, because my great grandfather was taken and he, he was forced to live outside the island. And anyway, my, my mom, she, she knew and she lived with my great grandfather. So even in the silence, he, he was used to, to live in. Uh, he trespassed a lot of things to my mom that after we studied and we read a lot and we, we met other Sagnam families, we know that this is pure Sagnam culture. So my very beginning when I was a child, um, the first I, advice I remember is like, when you're sad, you can go, you can hug a tree and you can cry with a tree and the tree will, will bring you, I don't know, energy and love. Um, but I was raised anyway as a, any Chilean person. Like I, I wasn't raised like an indigenous uh, person. And I think that's the reason because I, I started like living like the way I do. I traveled a lot, like looking for something. And only two years ago, I, I knew for the first time Tierra del Fuego. And, uh, it was a period of seven days, not really much, but still it marked me so much that I, two months later, I moved into Tierra del Fuego. 
I, by the time I moved in, in 2021, I had to speak the truth. I barely knew what a peatland was. I, I, I wasn't familiar with the, the whole concept of peatland. And uh, I was starting to hear about it, starting to read about it. And I didn't know in central Chile it's not really known. So my first trip to when I was already a resident of the island, my first trip to a, a forest or a wood, um, I had to, to walk on a peatland and I didn't realize it at the first time. I, I just walked into this forest and I had to, to, to take my shoes off because it, it was so soft and it, trying to, to take my boot out of my foot. So yeah, um, I really loved it. I felt like a child anymore. Or well, anyway, uh, I, again, sorry, again. Uh, it was like playing in the, in the mud and just walking around and I know I had to change everything, my pants, my socks, uh, because I was all wet and I just never put my, my shoes again back. Um, I really love this feeling of my, my skin touching the water, uh, as we can see in, in the image before um, behind me. Um, it, it is not the same pit line I had to cross, but sometimes you're, you're just walking and this water appears. So you have two, two chances. It's like superficial water or it's deep enough to, to make you lost inside. And so yeah, it was only superficial water my first time, uh, like mm -hmm. me. But then I, I went back home and I described these feelings and, and this uh, experience I had. And people I was talking to, they said, that was a pit plan. And oh no, that, that thing that I was reading about. Yeah, yeah, the same thing. So uh, since that moment when I realized how it makes me feel to be there, to, to smell it, to touch it, um, that's the moment I realized that I really wanted to help Pitland uh, from Tierra del Fuego. I, of course, I'm talking about uh, that moment. I was absolutely ignorant about everything. So I thought like the Tierra del Fuego was the, the most important part of the world for Pitland because I didn't know in every part of the world there's a Pitland. So I was really, really selfish, I know. But yeah, that's the breaking point of my love for peatland. Then next time I start going to peatlands, I, I was absolutely conscious about the meaning of that visit. And I know I just feel that that same thing that I said at the beginning is not just a, a beautiful landscape. It's not just um, an ecosystem really, really helpful for humanity. It's some part of me. It's, it's a part of my history. I was forced to be born and to grow up and in another place. And, and coming back to the island, knowing the island and knowing this specific ecosystem uh, has made me realize that I don't know, it, the, the story is true, you know, because sometimes you hear stories and you say, okay, yeah, that could be 50% truth, 25% and I don't know, just sensationalism and 25% just improvisation. But I can speak for myself and for some of my, my, my people from the community. Um, for certain people, peatlands are not, are, no, they are ancestors. They are alive. And, and linking that to the peat fest, one of the questions on the, the brochures is what are peatlands? 
and I can assure you and say you 100% sure for us, for certain people, peatlands are 100% alive. They are ancestors. They, they once were alive just like us and they have seen mi millennia of history of the island. How birds come and go, how many species of birds come and go, how the Wanako is um, growing, how they migrate, uh, how the fox is, I don't know, uh, eating eggs from these different bird species. So I think it's really important for me um, as a person, as a person absolutely involved right now with peatlands in different levels, um, try to try to make people understand that it's as any other part of the nature. It's not just a, a nice place to go make a fire and camp a day and then leave everything behind, leave trash, leave bottles, leave fuel, everything. It's like I, I once heard one of the ancient uh, or the old people of my community, no one wants to mutilate a, a, a relative and that's one of the, the things that everyone that's harming peatlands in Tierra del Fuego is doing to our ancestors, to our relatives. So, I don't know, in this part, I've, I've been involved also uh, with different actors of the uh, protection of the peatlands in the island. And one of them, as you mentioned, uh, was Ensayos. They invited me to be part of the project Turba Tol Hol Hol Tol. Um, hol Hol, it means peatlands in Selznam language, and Tol means heart in Selznam language. Too. So the translation of this pavilion name is the, the heart of the peatland. And I, I was involved in this project, not from the very beginning, but long enough to, to love, love it. And I, I had the opportunity to be at the pavilion before the, the opening and for a couple months. So um, I'm absolutely impressed mm -hmm. on how sphagnum in this case, the sphagnum can, can grow and can adapt to different environments and conditions and how they, they don't do what, what we expect if we, if we want to the, the sphagnum to, to grow, I don't know, all plain. And at the same time, and we want them to grow five centimeters in two months, they would do absolutely the opposite. And I think this kind of knowledge made me realize that in, in my perspective as indigenous people and my experience monitoring and, and looking for the growth of the, the sphagnum at the pavilion. Um, and I'm just deeply in love with the peatland, with the species they have. Um, in here, I, I'm not really aware of the peatland around the world, but at least in Tierra del Fuego, they also provide with berries. So you know, it's a whole ecosystem. They, birds go and make nests there and they provide us with food and clean water and enough. I, I just want to help people notice this because they they don't see a potential salvation for the humanity. They, they just see like uh, oh, something nice just to go jump in it and maybe make a, a body print on the sphagnum and and then they go so i know uh, i also wanted to share that as i mentioned certain people were away from the island for over 100 years and our of our way to be to be raised was not indigenous in most of the cases and still every every single person from my community that had 
go to the island and stay in the in the pitland and we all feel the same connection that we we wanted to feel i don't think it's just um a desire i think this this has ancient roots that is like you can escape the your destiny um sometime in our genetic memory we we weren't were living in the pitland or beside the pitland and i think this is how i can link uh, the the first story that i i told you that it's an ancestor or a lot of them that they were tired and they they took a nap and they never woke up but they didn't die and they they lost their human uh shape but they they start being eternal i hope <laughs> unless humankind decide the opposite but but if they can live hundreds and thousands of years i think we have a lot of knowledge to gather from them and maybe science can can help in this matter i know science is important to to bitland conservation and protection but in this matter spiritual matter uh, i think we have a lot to learn maybe not just in tierra del fuego um, but also in other places pitlands and indigenous cultures they were always together and they were always well preserved so i i don't know what else to say i'm i'm deep, deeply in love with with pitlands and i i know I, I had something else to to add but i totally forgot it did you want to share okay. sorry irene no, I was just going to say it's completely OK that you forgot it. Um, thank you for the wonderful story so far. And I think, Bianca, you're going to ask about the pictures. Yeah, yeah. I was really curious about seeing at least some of the like really cool pictures that you've taken. Yeah. <laughs> cool. This was a trip I made on March. Um, this place is called Lago Despreciado. I don't know who put the name, but it's really not good. <laughs> it's like your, I don't know, when you want to make a site something, that's the special. And well, this is the lake, mountains, and a part of the peatland. Uh, that was a really nice day. It wasn't really cold, no rain. And you can see that there's always like some water and inside the water, I, I haven't seen any fish or something like that, but you can also find a lot of insects and, and berries, as I, I said before, I think I took some pictures of the berries. And well, of course, um, this part of the island, the south of the island actually, is really in trouble right now because we have an invasion from beavers. So it's really complicated because they are harming the peatland. They use every river and every arm of water or whatever is living from the peatland. And they make their, their swimming pools and their houses and, and in Tierra del Fuego at least the forest is really new the soil is not deep enough so if the trees fall even from from the wind you can imagine what happens when they they have beavers on the sides and uh, in between the, the forest basically our goods are drowning and the impact that it causes to the peatland you can see it right here in in these pictures in this uh, not only in this place of the island but oh no okay that's too much um let me see what, what is i know have another part are beavers not native then to that area no they were introduced oh. on the in the 60s 
Um, yeah, and they were released and around for 15 years, hunting beavers was, was forbidden. So yeah, basically they, they brought them, didn't control them and the factory didn't work. So they just let the, the beavers be. So now they live um, in the whole island and even they're, they're crossing Magellan Strait. They're living in Isla Dawson and some points also in the continent in Punta Arenas that also has been attacked for, for the beavers. But this is one of the berries I said. It's really, they're delicious. It's like, you know, <laughs> eat something with a lot of air. So yeah, beaver, they're not supposed to be to be in, in Chile. This, uh, they were from Canada. And yeah, of course we have different environments and the, the forest in Canada grew with, uh, with the beavers. So it's absolutely normal for those trees in Canada to be eaten and then they, they start growing again from the very good uh, the beavers left behind. In here is opposite. The, the beaver eat the tree and it's really not, not good enough uh, the time for this tree to grow again. And also um, the level of water. These kinds of tree, they don't survive with a lot of water. It's a soil that is mostly frozen or under snow. So when they are underwater, they just die. Like if you can see in this part, all these white trees, they are almost everyone is dead. So yeah, those, those are some of the pictures I took on March. Um, before that, I, I was into another pitlands, but my cameras wasn't really, no, they weren't good. So I don't think it's worth it to show that kind of pictures. Thank you, Fernanda, for sharing those with us. And uh, thank you also for sharing your story. Um, I think it's as terrible as it is that all of this displacement uh, and colonialism happened. Um, it's really beautiful to hear that the connection is still alive, um, as you say, and that you have found that connection. And I think what you said about being in love with the peat, I think it's something that resonates with many of us here. Um, I just. I have a, a few questions myself um, in case no one else comes up. So I'll just get started because uh, I'm quite curious. Um, what you you said that, um, for example, the the tree, like if you feel sad, you can hug the tree and it can give you love and reassurance. Um, is there any um, particular uh, rituals or um, or character that uh, the peat uh, the peatland as an ancestor has um, in uh, Saknam culture, as far as you know. Um, not it, not the same as a tree, but yeah, this was what I forgot. Thank you. <laughs> um, usually, not it. It wasn't all the time. But for certain people, for example, the burial ceremony, it, it, it's not the same as other cultures. Uh, we, we never had a, a cemetery, for example. And also the, the location of, the, of a dead body was known only for the people that took, took the body there. So depending on, on the age and uh, the size, um, I don't know, from three to seven people knew the location of the body. Um, in the north of the island, uh, well, they, they try whatever they could because there's no forest. But in the south, when, where we have the, the, the woods, we have the peatland. The peatland was also used as a body deposit. <laughs> So basically, we, we didn't accu uh, go to the peatland for consolation or, or anything like that. But uh, we, we know for sure that it's a kind of cemetery. 
of course, only it's the same pattern. Only the people who took the body there, uh, they they only knew where the body was um, submerged. But yeah, it's also kind of kind of cemetery that we we don't have any any data about it. It's only well, we don't know the location, we don't know everything, and it's also information that. I, I I give, but with no no much information about it, because there's a lot of people that is trying to to go and mine the deep land, not only for for the I don't know the sphagnum for example, but I don't know we just want to avoid to give a lot of information about it. But but yes, it it wasn't a ritual or a ceremony. But peatlands in our culture was part of the life and the death. As peatlands are inherently, aren't they? Bianca <laughs> <laughs> um, asked, what's the name of the berries that you showed? Chaura. Chaura. Could you write that for us? All right. Thank you so much. It's so nice. Perfect, thank you. Um, I'm also wondering, you said that a lot of the displacement happened to sort of make space for, for sheep um, to, to be on the grass, I suppose. Um, what's, the, um, what's the current state of the peatlands in Tierra del Fuego? Like, are many of them still intact? Are there some restoration efforts? Um, is there a lot of peat under threat or in a really poor condition? Yeah, well, First, I, I think you have to know that the island is um, is mostly private. You know, it has different owners, and luckily, <laughs> WCS, the Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, is administrating a big part of the south of the island, where a lot of peatlands and forests are. So every peatland in this park is protected. Uh, peatlands outside the park. Um, yeah, well, well, we have seen a lot of uh, traffic, for example. Um, but luckily, the, the, the roads to the south of the island, they're not really good. And it's um, the connection, I don't know, phone connection is it, not really good either. So not a lot of people go there. So it's not like a massive place to go. Um, anyway, yeah, there, there are some peatlands that are in danger right now. Not the same danger that in other places because we have this, this in favor that is really, really far away. And the roads are not for any kind of vehicle. And yeah, the, at some point it's saving some peatlands from, from being mined. Yeah, funny how that works, huh? Yeah. Um, one question from uh, Oke okay in the chat, um, and I think then we will go into a wrap up. Um, do you think the new Chilean constitution will have an influence on peatlands in Tierra del Fuego and the Soknam people? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I hope, well, this Sunday we have this, um, we have to go and vote if, if we want the new constitution. So if the approved option wins, um, there's a lot of chances for the environment itself, not only peatlands, but ecosystems and you know, everything else would be a little bit more protected. Of course, it's only like a constitutional, um, article, it has to be um, written into a law, converted into a law. So there's still, it's not enough. It's a good first step, uh, but it's not enough. It's not the last, it's far, far away from being the last step. But yeah, in, in regarding to the Sejnam people, um, same thing. Yeah, we will be recognized at a constitutional level, but we'll still have to fight for this legal recognition. It's not the same to be into a law 
that being into our, the constitution. So I think it works basically the same for the Pitland's right and for Vietnam people's right. Yeah, thank you for that reflection. Um, it's always tricky to predict how the the law on paper and reality um, will end up uh, synchronizing or not synchronizing. Um, I would love to ask you for a few last words and afterwards I propose we take a five minute comfort break and then we uh, move on to the Defendamos Chiloé uh, part of the session. Um, would you like to share some last words, Fernanda? Uh, yeah, well, first, thank you for inviting me. Thank you for everyone that is watching it now and in the future. And I think when, when people like us that love something in common and that we are gathering together just to, to talk about it, it's a good beginning for starting making something. So, so thank you for being this amazing group that are gathering more groups that everyone is in love with Pitlands. So I, I just want to say like, go ahead and, and don't, don't lose your energy and, and let's, let's do whatever it takes to protect every Pitland that we can.